Hello, my name is Earl McCowan, and today I want to talk about uh, the Polaroid instant picture cameras and Dr. Edwin Land, the founder of the company of Polaroid, that manufactured these cameras. And I want to put, try to put in perspective how remarkable these cameras, especially the SX-70, were uh, for their day and time. But first, a little bit about Dr. Land himself. He was a genius inventor and scientist. He holds 533 patents, which makes him only second to Thomas Edison with the most, num most number of patents with the U.S. Patent Office. He attended Harvard University, but ended up dropping out twice because he wanted to pursue his inventions in science. He never graduated, but was awarded an honorary degree, both from Harvard and other universities. His first big success was inventing a synthetic material that would polarize light. That material is now used in photographic uh, filters, sunglasses, all the liquid crystal displays, and 3D movie glasses. He did try to uh, have the same film applied to automobile headlights and windshields, but he was unsuccessful in convincing the auto industry that they needed to do this. Um, having the windshield and the headlights polarized uh, would eliminate all the glare that one would get from oncoming car headlights. During the war, uh, World War II, he helped to develop uh, high-resolution cameras for the U.S. spy planes like the U-2 and also spy satellites. But what he's best known for, perhaps, is the instant picture camera. The early cameras he uh, produced uh, were very, very complicated to use, required many precise steps in order to ensure proper development of the picture. The pictures came out wet and had to uh, be allowed to sit for a while to dry before you could touch them. And the early black and white films had to be coated. Uh, there was a chemical that had to be uh, spread across the surface of the print in order to keep it from fading and uh, to help protect it from scratches. Those early films were also very messy. They created a lot of trash and that trash was also contaminated with this developing uh, solution, which was a, a gelatinous solution, and if you got that solution on your skin, it was, it was very caustic. Then he came up with the SX-70 film camera, instant picture camera, and that was his crowning achievement. All the shortcomings of the previous cameras were addressed in this new camera. It was sold from 1972 till 1981, and the original cost was $180, which in today's money would be about $1,100. And the film back then cost $7 for a pack of 10 pictures. Today, the same uh, $7 would cost $44. Um, and today's film, which uh, is available still, uh, made by other companies, uh, goes for about $25. This camera, as you can see here, doesn't look much like a camera. In fact, it's probably, if you've never seen one, you might wonder what the heck it is. It might look like a, a cigar case, or it might look like an old cassette player, um, anything but a camera. That's because it's a collapsible, single-lens reflex camera. And what starts off life as a flat, uninteresting shape, when you open it up by pulling up on the uh, little viewfinder portion, it suddenly springs to life and is transformed in the way it looks. Uh, what was before a flat and fairly uninteresting object now turns into this three-dimensional angular work of art. The uh, camera uh, reminds me a bit of the old toys that were popular with kids 10 or 20 years ago uh, that were called transformers and you would uh, unfold various parts of this toy to transform it from a from a car to an airplane or something. Whereas this transforms into a beautiful single lens reflex camera. The light path going through the camera, like I said, is single lens reflex. So when you look through the viewfinder, you're actually looking out through the lens itself. And here's a diagram of, of the light path of this camera. Light comes in through the lens here and is reflected off of a mirror that is along the back side of the camera body, right there. 
The light is then reflected down into the base of the camera on what's called a Fresnel mirror, which is a mirror that has little ridges on it that helps to focus the light rays and projects them back up to the upper part of that same viewing mirror that you had here. And from there it's reflected out to the, this front mirror. It's neither flat nor spherical in shape, but it's actually aspherical, which is a very complex shape that uh, is difficult to produce. Then the light and the image comes back through the eyepiece and into your eye. So what you see is exactly what the lens is seeing. Quite remarkable for its time and very complicated uh, light path. Um, the camera only has uh, two controls and then the shutter button. Otherwise it's fully automatic. And this control on the left hand side of the camera is to adjust for exposure. And if, you're, if you take a picture and you find out that it's a little too dark, you would move this dial so that it's more toward the, the white area of the dial. If it's too light, you would then move it so that it darkens the picture like that. And this dial is reset automatically every time you close the camera, reset to the neutral position. This dial over here is the focusing uh, knob, and this camera is quite remarkable uh, for its day in that it will focus to 10.4 inches away from uh, the camera, which is about here. So you really need to have that ability to see what the lens is seeing because when you're that close, if the viewfinder does not line up with the image, your subject, then you're not going to have the subject centered in your viewfinder. So this dial controls the focus. And then, as I said, this big red button is the is the shutter button, and uh, it's all electronic. On the side, next to this lens area here, is a little socket uh, where you can plug in a custom uh, Polaroid-made cable release. So if you wanted to trip the shutter without moving the camera, if it's on a tripod in very low light, you could use this shutter, this uh, cable release, which was electronic, to trip the shutter. And the body of the camera, which might appear to be metal, is actually not. It's all plastic, but it is plated with an alloy of nickel, copper, and chromium, so that it appears to be metal, and, uh, but it's actually not. They, they did manufacture a, uh, uh, a second model later on that was cheaper, that did not have this metal plating, and it was all white in color, and, uh, and, and looked plastic, looked very cheap. And all the cameras had this leather coating, which is very elegant looking um, for the camera. You'll notice on the bottom of the camera, there's no tripod socket. They sold a separate uh, adapter that you would place the camera in this adapter, and it would then allow you to mount it to a tripod. On the back of the camera is a countdown uh, film counter. When you load a brand new pack of film in the camera, it uh, resets to 10 and there's 10, 10 exposures in the pack of film and it counts down to zero and so you know how many pictures you have left. The, the new film that's available for the camera only has eight exposures, therefore you have to remember that you, if it says you've got three left, you actually only have one picture left. Uh, later cameras had a built-in sonar unit that would allow for auto-focusing so that this unit would send out a sound wave, much like a bat or a, or a dolphin, uh, sends out sonar uh, signals. They bounce off the subject, come back, and the, thereby the camera can calculate the distance and automatically set the uh, focusing distance for, for your subject. This top slot right up here is for a flash bar. It was made specifically for the SX-70 camera it had 10 flash bulbs in it, five on one side, five on the other. So you'd plug that flash bar in just above the lens, and every time you'd take a picture, the flash would go off. And uh, once you'd exposed all five and fired off five of the flashes, you would unplug it, turn it around, plug it back in, and you get five more. There were 10 flash bulbs since there were 10 pieces of film in the, in the film pack. Now. Uh, to power the camera, there is a battery that's built into the film pack. I'll show you how that is removed. This yellow 
uh, lever on the side of the camera right here. Press down on that and the front of the camera drops open. Inside, this is an empty film pack, so I'll pull it out. And there is the film pack. Normally there would be a stack of, of eight pictures in this section. And in the very bottom is a battery. And there's two contacts right here on the bottom of the film pack, which uh, establish contact with the camera. And the battery in here will power the camera. Back in the day, in the 70s and 80s, uh, no one thought much about throwing away a battery in the trash. Today that would be unthinkable to throw a battery into the trash can, but back then it was no big deal. So this is the film uh, packet. Again, we open the camera. This just gets slotted right in here. Push it all the way. And when you close the camera, if that was a brand new film pack, out would come a dark slide, which protects the light sensitive uh, film inside the pack. You'd throw that away and then you're all set to go to take your pictures. Um, as I mentioned, the older film, uh, the pictures came out wet and you, had to, you couldn't touch them for a while. Here's a picture that I took not too long ago. And these pictures uh, are completely dry when they come out. Um, the, this is a clear mylar sheet on the front which uh, protects the picture. And uh, the film has three pouches, three little pods in the bottom. And as the picture is being ejected from the camera, two steel rollers, which are right here in the front of the camera, will squeeze that uh, developing chemical chemicals out across the picture area so the picture can begin developing. And uh, the picture is developed in, in broad daylight. Uh, they do recommend that you keep the picture in subdued light um, immediately after taking the picture. Back in the Back in the early days of this Polaroid camera, these pictures would develop in a couple of minutes. They eventually got the process down to where the pictures would develop in about a minute. Uh, these modern films uh, take about 10 or 15 minutes to develop fully. And uh, so they haven't got the technology down as well as they had it back in the 70s, but I think that's because of uh, uh, EPA requirements. There's chemicals they can't use inside the film pack anymore. I said the film was as remarkable as the camera. Here's a cross section of the film before it was ejected from the camera and afterwards. And the film is made up of about 13 different layers of, with uh, acids and alkaline uh, chemicals and uh, dye layers and uh, light sensitive layers. And uh, uh, there were some parts that were acid and some parts that were alkaline and that controlled the development of the picture um, and once it was all done, it was, it was uh, a beautiful full color picture. And then uh, this is the set of layers after development. And uh, you can see that certain layers were blocked uh, depending upon if it was red light or blue light or green. And, uh, and that produces all the colors of the spectrum that you would expect in a color image. One thing that people liked to do back in the day, occasionally, was to manipulate the photo after it was taken. Um, after the film was, uh, or during the development stage of the film, and even for a number of hours thereafter, the, the film, the image was still somewhat fluid. It was made of a gel and it was still somewhat fluid and could be manipulated by taking a pen or a stylus and scratching on this outer surface of the uh, picture. You could then move the dies around a little bit. You could squeeze it with your thumb and finger and, uh, and you'd end up with a very impressionistic looking photograph. So I hope you've enjoyed this description of the SX-70 camera and a little history of Dr. Edwin Land, a remarkable man. And if you liked the video, remember to give me a thumbs up and subscribe. And uh, I'll look for you in the next one. Thank you.